Well, hello, welcome back. We're now at lesson four of our Peaceful Sea based on Winslow Homer. So I hope you've been watching all of these lessons in sequence as we work together to create a beautiful seascape so far in watercolor, but we're going to add a new medium today, chalk pastel. So let's review what you need for this last lesson of our Peaceful Sea. You'll need your watercolor painting so far, your pan of watercolors, either eight or 16, an assortment of brushes, but truly you need to make sure you have one really small or fine brush, especially important today. Some paper plates for your palette, a bowl of water, a cup of water to make new puddles, some paper towels to check your brushes, and the additional thing, you'll need a white chalk pastel. You might have a set of chalk pastels, most of them have white in there, or you can even find white chalk pastel individually at your local art and craft supply store. Okay, so the last time we were together, we did all of the large elements of our composition. The sky, the lake, the beach. Anytime you're working on a drawing or a painting, my friends, it's always important to start with the general things or the larger things and then work towards the details or the smaller things. Because if you were to start to do some fine details first, some of the other elements you might add in might cause it to change and that would have been a lot of work that would have been wasted. So you always work very general such as background or base color, things like that. Large areas first and then detail. And so today we're going to be putting in the detail of our peaceful sea like our sailboats and details on the cloud. I'm really excited about that step. Of course, we can't move any further until you're sure that the painting is dry. So hopefully from lesson three, you've let everything dry and we're ready to go. Great. So the first thing we want to do is create a color with a small puddle for what we're going to do, the hull of the boat. The hull is the bottom part of the boat, the part that rests in the water. And I don't want to use a cool color because I have a lot of cool colors here. I have a blue sky and green foliage in the background and cool colors in my water. So I want to use a warm color. So how about we go with like a maroonish red. So from my cup, I'm going to make a very small puddle. And with my medium brush, I'm going to load a red. So load your brush by rolling gently side to side and re-dip into the puddle. But I don't want it to be too bright. I want it to be a little more like maroon color. So one of the ways you can do that, friends, is add a little bit of purple and a little bit of brown. One of the things I love to do with watercolors is experiment with color mixing. So now I have a color that I like for my boat. I'm actually going to get my smallest brush, whatever fine brush you have. And I'm going to start with my large boat. And because not all of the boat is above the water, of course, some of the boat is down in the water. We're only going to paint what we see, which is the boat that rests outside the water, and so it's going to be thinner. And it's going to be a shape that's more like a thick line right underneath the sail. And then it comes back in on itself. So you see a wider spot over here and then narrower. I want to make that color a little more intense, so I'm going to add a little bit more brownish red here. Now, I'm not going to re-dip into my puddle. With whatever is left on the brush, I'm going to do the hull of the boats that are far away. The reason is, friends, we talked about how colors are lighter and duller as they recede in the distance. So the color will not be as intense, so that's why I'm not going to re-dip. Whatever is left on my brush, I'm just doing a small dash kind of line underneath the sail, and so it's lighter and less intense. Now, I want to work on the sail, and this is going to be a little tricky. So on the opposite side of your puddle, 
you're going to make a very small, no bigger than a dime. That's actually probably a little too much. So if you pour too much water, you can always blot some up. That's why we always have paper towel handy. There we go. So now in that tiny little puddle, I think I'll use my medium brush. It loads better. I'm going to load a gray-brown. So for that, a lighter shade of gray. Is, uh, gray is actually just a lighter shade of black. So I'm going to go into my black roll, but I want it to be gray, so I'm not going to take a lot. So there's a great gray. And now some brown. There we go. That's a nice light gray-brown. Perfect. But I want to use my smallest brush, friends. And what I'm going to do with this gray-brown, I want to make extremely fine lines. Take a look at this painting that we've looked at before by Winslow Homer called Home Sweet Home. This is that scene from the Civil War, and he provided incredible detail. Look at the kindling in that little meager fire. Homer had to use a very fine brush and a very steady hand to get that level of detail in this amazing painting. Now, to do really fine lines takes a very controlled hand, which means sometimes you have to practice. And that's why I have this scrap paper here, because I want to demonstrate for you how to do this. Whenever you have a paintbrush, the length of the brush, if I were to press all the way down till the ferrule, that's that silver part is the ferrule, till the ferrule reaches it, you see how thick of a line I can make, like so. But I don't want a thick line like that. So what I want to do is barely press down at all so that just the hairs on the very end of my brush and I'm going to hold the brush straight up and down, not like a pencil, but more straight up and down and barely whisper touch the paper. And because my arm is resting down, I have a little more control. I'm, my arm's not up, up in the air like this. My arm is down and I'm barely pressing so that I get a nice fine line. Now friends, it does take some practice and I don't want you to get frustrated. If your line comes out a little thicker than you like, that's why you have paper towel handy. So grab a piece of paper towel, just a small piece like this, and you're going to keep it handy so that if you put down a line you don't like, you can blot it right back up. So dip into the gray-brown puddle that you've made with your smallest brush. And I'm going to do a line that will be the mast of the ship. The mast is that long pole that holds the sail. And it's going to go from the hull up. And I hold my brush almost straight up and down. And I make a thin line. And that's all I need. Now you can see how wet on wet it went into the hull. So I'm going to use my paper towel and blot that up. Let's try that again on the smaller boats. Very thin line of the mast. There we go. Barely touching that brush onto the paper. I don't want to press down, otherwise all those hairs will splay out. Like that. Now friends, what I'm going to suggest that you do is also do the same type of thing around the edges of the sail. As light a touch as you can. And notice that paint is not very dark. Like that. The finest brush you have, I'm holding it almost straight up and down. Very light shade of gray, brown, See that? Very fine. How did you do? I bet you did better than you thought. So the important tip to remember is if you press hard, it spreads the head of the brush out. If you keep your touch really light, you can get a very fine line. So I'm done with the sails and the hull of the boat. And the boats in the distance are lighter than the boat that's up closer. That's another tip of aerial perspective. But we're not done yet. So now that we've finished all of that detail in this area here, it's wet. And so we want to leave that be and move to an area where it's dry. So we're going to create a shadow underneath the rock. 
Now, we're not really sure where the sun is in this picture. We can only assume that it's way overhead, which means the shadow under the rock will be fairly shallow. Um, it's not going to be a big, long shadow, but uh, a short shadow. But we still want to put that in there because this is a beautiful, sunny day on the lake. So see that puddle of gray-brown that we already have? We're going to work with that. Switch over to your medium brush, and we're going to add some more brown. Roll and load the brush. We're just going to go right back into that puddle. Load that up. And then we're going to add some of that orange color that we used in the sand, right into the same puddle. Twirl my brush to load and right back in there for kind of a golden, there we go. Now use that brush and right underneath that rock we're going to make a nice dark line. Hmm, I think I want that to be darker. I want it to really show that it's a shadow. So into that puddle I will add just a little bit of black. There we go. So it should be kind of a combination of brown and yellow and orange and, and black so that's deeper than the sand color. And I'm making a line right underneath the large rock and underneath the small rock that will be darker than the rock. And it's just showing a little bit of shadow onto the sand. See, all of these little details that we're adding, friends, are what makes a painting really special. Small little details that you can add, shadows, highlights, things like that. So, all right, so now that we're finished with the shadow under the rock and we have our sail and our hull, now we're ready to add in some details with a new medium, which I'm so excited about. It's our clouds. Now, most people think of clouds as white, but actually there's a lot of color in clouds. Look at this painting that we have from Winslow Homer of Gloucester Harbor that we've been looking at while we've been doing all of these lessons. You can hardly call those clouds white. I see lots of beige and peach and brown and blue. And so there's a lot going on in these clouds. Now, most people think of clouds as white, and that is an important part of clouds. So we're going to be adding some white into our clouds, but we don't want them to look like a solid shape. So take your chalk pastel, and we're going to add white at the top of the two clouds that we blotted out. Remember, in lesson one, we blotted out with a tissue some of the watercolor paint in the wash in order to create our clouds. And now we're going to use a chalk pastel and make small circular motion at the top of the cloud, but not straight across, kind of a puffy, jagged shape like this. just at the top. And then with a clean finger, you're going to blend it in down towards the bottom. So it will wind up being a little different color than the bottom of the cloud. So the top of the cloud will be a little different. You can see how it's a bumpy, jagged shape. Now when you go to do the second cloud, don't try to make it look like the first one. It should feel different, have a different shape. So I'm using the white pastel in a circular motion and I'm going across the top. This cloud's kind of taller over here. And then with my finger, I'm going to blend in that chalk dust down like so. And that creates a, a lot more interest in those clouds. Now we're not finished with our chalk pastel. Because this is white and it can work nicely over here, we're going to add in some beautiful glistening highlights on the water. Because water, its reflective nature, if there's a sun out, there'll be a lot of sparkliness and glistening on the water. And so just like when we were painting, we used horizontal strokes, strokes that go across small. You're going to do that with your chalk pastel. And they're going to pick up some of the texture of the watercolor paper, and that's great. So small lines like dashes across this water 
with the white, like so, to show some glistening on the water. Now we have our sail and we want to show the reflection of the sail in the water. And so here's where you're going to do much more white. But remember, it's a reflection, so it's the opposite shape. So our sail is wider on the bottom and gets narrower at the top. So it's the opposite. The reflection will be wider towards the hull and narrower as it goes away. So you're going to put in white marks so that you have kind of a triangular shape. It should not look like a solid block. You should have some of the strokes that we made with the paint come through. Same thing with our ones that are in the distance. We want to put in that little bit of reflection of the sail. Can you see that? Now we're just putting some glistening highlights on our water. But you could use a lot of white if you were showing turbulent water. See, Homer settled eventually in the state of Maine and he lived on the coast and he was surrounded by water all the time. He loved doing seascapes. But also the, at the coast of Maine there was a lot of violent waves that would crash against the rocks there. Take a look at this painting by Homer called Weather Beaten. Look at how that water is just crashing against the rocks and look at all the white there. Now the reason there's so much white in that painting is because whenever there's turbulent water, it throws up a lot of bubbles and those bubbles appear to us as white. So if you're doing a violent sea or perhaps if you've been to the ocean and watched waves as they crash, it looks like foam and it's very white. And that's because of all the bubbles that are agitated up by that turbulent ocean. But ours is a peaceful sea, so the white that we're going to see in here is a reflection of the sun, not because of turbulent water. But white is an important element to add in any seascape, whether it's rough sea or peaceful sea. That reminds me of scripture from Psalms. Psalms, of course, is one of my favorite books. This is Psalm 93. And it says, Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, Mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Have you ever been to the ocean when a storm is rolling in? I have. The water's so rough and the waves are so high, it can be kind of scary. And you see how much power there is in that ocean. But do you know, God created that ocean, and so God is more powerful than anything that we experience in nature, even the roaring waters. Maybe you don't live near an ocean, but you know how violent water can be sometimes, even just a bad storm. Isn't it nice to know that God is more powerful than any of that? He is mightier than any of that? The fun thing is, God is even more peaceful than any peaceful lake that we could experience as well. And that is a wonderful feeling, knowing that God is in control of everything. So as you add in the highlights on the water, be careful that you don't overdo it. It's fun to use the white pastel and create those highlights, but you spent a lot of time working on those beautiful watercolor strokes to add value into your water, and so I would hate for that to be covered over. A little goes a long way. So let's review what we learned throughout this project. We learned about how to do a graded wash that goes from dark to light, and how to do a flat wash as our base for our lake. We learned about the salt technique to create texture and the smushed plastic bag technique to also create texture. We learned about blotting up to take away some of the color to create white space. We also learned scumbling, how to suggest a horizon line. And we learned about foreground, middle ground, and background, and aerial perspective when you're doing a landscape or a seascape. And we've also learned about that great American icon of seascapes, Winslow Homer. So I hope you feel peaceful when you look at your peaceful sea and that you'll be willing to go out and even try another project using some of the techniques you learned. Remember, if you took really good care of your brushes while we were doing this project, you'll be able to do many more watercolor projects for a long time with your supplies. I'm so glad you joined me for this peaceful sea project and I'll see you for another art project from See the Light. Bye bye.